This week, the world changed in one night. Before our very eyes, the world has changed in one night. Early Thursday morning, Vladimir Putin and the Russian army invaded the sovereign nation of Ukraine. Bombs and missiles bombarded the defenseless people of the Ukraine by a megalomaniac trying to expand his borders and bring back the glory of the old Soviet Union. A man that is so intoxicated with his power that the threats of sanctions or the possibility of massive loss of life means nothing to him. And the world thought that we had unity by gathering around sporting events at the Beijing Olympics, but in a matter of days that was all obliterated. Tens of thousands fleeing children and women in the Ukraine are leaving without their husbands that are between the ages of 18 and 60 because they're being called to defend their country even as we are here right now. And while we slept in our beds last night, Families in the Ukraine are sleeping in the subway system. While we slept wondering what time we would wake up this morning, the Ukrainians slept wondering if they would ever wake up. And what you are seeing is even possibly setting up another invasion that as you're sitting here today, that possibly even China into Taiwan. A day after the Ukraine invasion, China sent nine of their military jets over Taiwan as a flyover and as a warning. And I believe that there is more coming, church. And no one knows if Russian and Putin are even done with their advances. This will will not only move towards NATO countries, but literally, I'm just telling you, Pastor Carter and I were talking about this, this literally has ramifications of moving to the Middle East, like even the book of Ezekiel talks about. Jesus warns us to see current events as kingdom events. Let me say that again. Jesus warns us in the scriptures to see current events as kingdom events, that what you're witnessing right now, as some of you are watching on TV, has kingdom ramifications. This is what Jesus warns us about in Luke chapter 12, verse 54. He says, Jesus said to the crowds, gathered around him when you see a cloud forming in the west you say a storm is brewing and then it arrives and when you see the south wind blowing you say a heat wave is on the way and so it happens and then he says this what hypocrites you are experts in forecasting the weather but unwilling to understand the spiritual significance of the time that you're living in in fact the message says it like this You know how to tell a change in weather, so don't tell me you can't tell a change in the season, the God season that we're in right now. That's what we're being challenged to do. And as we talked about last week, we are being challenged to open up our eyes in this God season that we're in, that this kind of war and invasion, I believe, is a sign and a signal of something that the church has lost the capacity to speak about today, or not maybe the capacity, has lost the voice. That when I grew up, when we began to see things, we began to hear this, look up for your redemption draws nigh. That we are literally beginning to witness what could very well be the last days, folks. Let Jesus define with his timeless words what he is saying from the Mount of Olives. This is what I want you to key in on. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Jesus privately and saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming? Meaning he's already there, so he's speaking about a second coming and the end of the age. Listen to what he says. Jesus said, see to it that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But don't be alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these are but the beginning of birth pains. Now church, I want you to listen very carefully. Because I know what God put upon my heart to share with you today. As our elders who, led by Elder Chooks, each morning we begin during the week to pray for you, to pray for ministries, to pray for the world. As we began to pray on, on Thursday morning after the invasion began to take place, it was, it was from a guttural cry from a place 
that Pastor Pavel, who I'll speak about in a few moments, who helps lead our summit campus, who's there now speaking, our summit campus from the Ukraine, began to, began to pray for his country. And at that moment, I knew what the Holy Spirit was saying for us today. And when Jesus said these words, the end is not yet. He says there will be wars. You'll see Ukraine and Russia. There'll be rumors of war. China and Taiwan and others that are right now beginning to brew. What does this mean for us right now? That Jesus' words 2,000 years ago, listen carefully, have much bearing on this moment on 51st and Broadway as it did on the Mount of Olives. That what he said 2,000 years ago has just as much significance today. Because let these roots take, take root, these words take root inside of you. Here's what he said. These are the beginning of birth pains. Birth pains. Listen, listen to the Apostle Paul speak about birth pains and further define them for us in the book of Romans and in his epistles years later. This is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, to this very day, we are, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as it were like the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation, Paul says. He says, but we who have experienced the fruit of the Spirit are inwardly groaning inside of us. As we passionately long, now he's about to speak about those last days, as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters from our bodies being physically transformed is what he says. For this is the hope of our salvation. But, but hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something if we already have it? Let me just say this to you today. God has put a groan in his creation and God has put a groan in his people today. Let me say that again. God has put a groan in his creation and God has put a groan in his people. The groan that that Paul is speaking about is a longing for the yet to be seen final restoration of creation in eternity. That's the groan. It's a longing for, to, for that final restoration where Jesus comes and makes things right. That whether the birth pains are felt internally, Romans 8, or whether they are felt or seen externally, Matthew 24, and what we're seeing happen in Europe right now, God speaks from these birth pains. He speaks to us. And I believe God is speaking right now to us. I believe he's speaking to the church. I believe God is beginning, asking us to lift our eyes to the throne. And God is ready for a coming and a last day's revival that is coming to this country and to the world. Let me say that again. God is speaking today. He's going to speak to his church. He is going to ask us to lift our eyes to the throne. And God is getting us ready for a revival that is going to happen in these coming days. I believe that's what he's getting ready to do. He is speaking to the church. He is going to set our eyes upon the throne, and he is going to put something in the hearts around this globe and planet for a revival that is going to come and sweep. And I believe it can happen in Russia. I believe it can happen in Ukraine and Belarus. I believe it can happen among soldiers. I believe God can start anywhere he wants to start. God is able to do that. Let me tell you what I believe today. Number one, that God is speaking to his church today. When a church doesn't feel those birth pains that the Apostle Paul speaks of or ignores them, then leaders respond to the wrong groans. Let me say that again. When the church, when we don't respond to those birth pains, what's happening in the Middle East, what is happening in Europe, what is happening around the world, when we're not responding to the groans, externally and internally, then we start responding to the wrong groans. Now this may get me in trouble, but it doesn't matter at this point. The groans of people start replacing the groans of the Spirit. When that happens, the church becomes man-focused instead of eternity-focused. When the church, when the pulpit loses the groan of the Holy Spirit, then we're wondering what the pew is saying. I don't, it doesn't matter what the pew is saying. What is heaven saying to us at this point? That's what God is asking us to do. We're building churches going, what does the pew think about this? That's the wrong groan. 
That's not the groan that God is asking for. They miss the deep groan that is coming from within. A groan that is coming from without that we're hearing around the world. He was the great writer and, and, and Christian who turned apologist defending the faith. C.S. Lewis gave us something. He, 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 almost, he really defined that groan of Romans 8 when C.S. Lewis speaks about an emptiness in this place that all of us carry with us. Listen to what he said. This is powerful. He said, our heavenly father has provided many delightful inns, or we would call them hotels, for us along our journey. But he takes great care to see that we don't mistake any of them for our home. You know what he was saying to us? He was basically saying this, don't make your home in a hotel when you have a heaven that we are moving towards. He says, don't get, so, don't get so intoxicated down here when God goes, there is an emptiness in our soul because we're longing for a different home here today. He says, don't over-decorate down here because there is a mansion that's being built in heaven for us today. That's where the investment begins to come. The pandemic was a wake-up call for the church. It was a dress rehearsal for upheaval that is coming. The war and Russian invasion now begins to turn into an alarm for the pulpits. And as we prayed and heard that groan on Thursday morning, as we began to hear Pastor Pavel begin to cry out for his country, and you heard here Tim and Violet from Russia and from Ukraine begin to cry out for their countries. That's the groan. You see, the groan in my heart is this. Listen carefully. The groan in my heart is that we are the church of Jesus Christ. Listen the Ukrainian church, the Russian church, Times Square church. Folks, some people say blood is thicker than water. That's true, but spirit is thicker than blood. Let me say that again, that it doesn't matter whether you are from Ukraine or if you're from Russia, or you're from New York City, it doesn't matter whether you're from China or Taiwan, the Spirit makes the church one. That's what it does. That's what God is calling the church to do. This is what David prayed when he saw the world being changed around him. See, historians believe that Psalm 46 was remembering, it was a remembrance psalm, a remembrance psalm song and prayer of God's deliverance from the Assyrian invasion of Judah. That Psalm 46, it was a recalling of a miracle deliverance from God. Hezekiah is the king of Judah and Isaiah is the prophet. Rumors were reaching Jerusalem at an, that an invincible enemy is coming. You, you put together the similarities. Assyria was the greatest military machine in the world and the most ruthless. And war not only seemed inevitable, defeat seemed unavoidable. And everyone knew that the Assyrians were merciless toward their victims. They defeated Israel, now they were setting their eyes on Judah. Israel was in their possession, now it was time to, cap to conquer the capital city of Jerusalem. And David says this prayer in this historical psalm, listen to what David says. God is our refuge and strength. He's our very hallelujah, present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change. We don't look that way. And listen to how he ends that psalm. He says these words in Psalm verse 9. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two and burns the chariots for fire. Why can he say that? He saw the deliverance of God. He sees the deliverance of God. And let me just say this. If God is the same yesterday and today and forever, then he can do whatever he wants, whether it was 2,000 years ago or whether it's two minutes ago. God is in charge of this planet. God is the one that's in charge. Listen to it. How did he make wars to cease? You ready for this? David, David begins to tell us that. The people of God prayed. That's what he's calling his church to. It's not just a unity to see that we are connected by the blood of Jesus. Not the blood of your DNA, but by the blood of Jesus. But number two, that the God is calling the church to pray. To be a place of prayer. Our general overseer, Pastor Carter Conlon, feels like that this is what his, his assignment is. Is to call the church back to prayer. 
Listen to how prayer changed the dimensions and, and really the future of this battle that seemed unwinnable. Here is what happens. This is the prayer that the king makes. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated this nation. Now, O Lord, our God, I pray deliver us from this hand and all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, you are God. Listen to this. What did God do with almost 200,000? This is interesting. But the similarities are incredible. What did God do with almost 200,000 enemy soldiers at the gates? You ready for this? Listen to it. Verse 35. Then it happened in a night that an that angel of the Lord went out and struck 185. Better than stinger missiles is an angel of the Lord. In the camp of the Assyrians, and when men rose up early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. Listen to this. God sent one angel to begin to turn the tide of one battle. And that's why I want you to understand this today. To the church of the Ukraine, that those that are watching here today, to our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world, in both Russia and the Ukraine, use the weapon of prayer. Use the weapon of prayer. To the Russian believers, pray for Ukraine. To those in Ukraine, pray for Russian believers, pray for revival. To us in the church in America, let's use the weapons that God has given to us. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war like the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, I've done it, I've seen it, and it's happening. You, you, when, when, when you hear the groan of people instead of the groan of heaven, then all of a sudden you miss that groan that God is asking for us. Nothing, I thought, began to bring such disturbance to my heart because I've participated in this, that the groan of the seats in churches today, I'm just going to say it, Because it's February and because it's Valentine's Day, the world around you is burning and we're going to speak about relationships and we're going to talk about how to date people and how to have a healthy man, which are all good things. But folks, we're not led by a calendar and led by Valentine's Day. We're led by a groan of heaven, an internal groan and an external groan. I I just want to just tell to the church in America, stop and let heaven guide you. Let Let the pulpits be guided, not by February. 14th, but what is God? We need a word from heaven today. We need a word from God today. I'm not judged. Listen, I'm just going to say this to you. February 14th, Valentine's Day and all that stuff, that doesn't guide whether we're going to speak on that. We are guided. What is God saying to us today? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us today? We have right now connect groups all over the world in one of our connect groups, one of our leaders from the Ukraine just got out, Angela. And Angela, we're praying for you here, but her, her husband is still there. And I told you last week that there is a coming spiritual battle and that connect groups are going to make the church mobile. That if the church is shut down, like it is in Ukraine, it can still be connected. That we're not, we're not simply just held on, holding on to a sanctuary here, but it's not, this, is, this place doesn't make us the body of Christ. Jesus makes us the body of Christ. And right now, I want to just say thank you. We, we couldn't put it on the screen right now, and I won't even mention to you the cities, but right now we've been on the phone, Treg and our missions department. We've got places right on the borders um, in in Ukraine that are becoming refuge, a place for refugees, that your generosity, we are able right now, they said, we've got people, we are sending resources for mattresses and food for all these refugees that are there. That's what, you're, that's, what, that's what you're doing with God's help. Your generosity right now. We've been on the phone and trying to figure out the best way we can get those resources. That's what you're doing today. They don't need to know the cities and they don't need, you don't need to know any of that. Just trust me, we're right in the process of doing all that because it's the body of Christ. 
And that's why I tell anyone from Russia or Ukraine right now, I'll just give you this word, and it's this, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, wither as the green herb, and here's what he tells the believers, trust in the Lord and do good, and here's my favorite part, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. That's our food. Folks, feed on his faithfulness. Come on, lift your hands and say, I'm going to feed on your faithfulness right now. Feed on his faithfulness. So to the church today, we are brought together by the cross, not by our DNA. To the church today, we need a word from God today that brings us together. We need a church that can pray here in the U.S. and a church that can pray abroad. Because let me tell you what God is doing. Number two, God is lifting our eyes to the throne today. God is showing us the futility to put our trust in really world leaders. Nobody can get us out of this mess today, folks. You have, you have people going backwards. Let me just say, I'll just say it. Listen, we're already in. Send your emails, do whatever you want. You have... Senator Romney telling President Obama, I told you about Russia in the debates. You have President Trump saying, this never would have happened under me. You have President Biden hoping the threat of sanctions to stop this. And you have Zelensky, President Zelensky, hoping from help from any place. Can I just tell you to all of our leaders, there is no help in people and places. Regardless on how commendable, listen, these leaders need as much help as we do. <laughs> That's not a slam. It's just to lift up your eyes to where our help comes from. We need something bigger and something greater than what we have today. Folks, some find their strength in weapons and wisdom. But listen, here's the part I want you to get. But my miracle deliverance can never be won by men. Our boast is in the Lord our God who makes us strong and gives us victory today. <laughs> Folks, what are you going to do? What are you going to do just to keep talking? Right now, Russia is already threatened with nuclear weapons today. This morning, they've threatened. Who, who's going to stop that? See, Isaiah realized that. The prophet who saw God send one angel to turn a battle around, that was a prophet 40 years of experience. But I want to read to you about Isaiah who believed in the God who answers prayer 40 years later. But what I want to read to you now is I want to read to you what Isaiah 40 years earlier was chastised by God because he was putting hope in a leader, the prophet, putting hope in a leader. And God goes, you have your eyes on the wrong thing. He, see, Isaiah was 40 years wiser when he was, saw the Assyrian army defeated. See, before Isaiah saw the throne, he trusted a throne of a king until something happened. The world changed for Isaiah in one night as it did for us when the person that Isaiah seemed to trust in Man, messed up everything. He died. And God would take that, that death and speak to Isaiah that you need to look higher than the throne you've been looking at. See, I think God is speaking to, to Ukraine to look higher than the allies. Look higher than NATO. Look higher than U.S. Look higher than if Germany is going to join the coalition. There is no other place to look to. Some trust in chariots and some trust, trust in horses, but we are going to trust in the name of the Lord. Listen to it. Because this is not the Assyrian defeated by an angel, Isaiah. This is an Isaiah 40 years younger who has a vision because he needs a vision of God. And this is what he writes 40 years earlier than what he saw a battle turn around. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, and each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. Church. It's usually not until crisis 
happens that men see the king. It's not until that you start to realize that there is no earthly king that can get us out of this mess. Isaiah knew the Lord, but it was in this tragedy that Isaiah saw the Lord. Let me say that again. Up to this point, he knew the Lord. But when crisis hit, he saw the Lord. We need to see him again. We need a vision of him again. See, one of the reasons that God brings trials and tribulations is to remind us that that our help doesn't come this way. Our help comes this way. See, although, get this, although a king has died, the king is alive and well. Let me just say that again. Although a king, Uzziah, has died, glory to God, the king is alive and well today. Listen, I remember a time when we were, Cindy and I were getting some books at Barnes and Noble and we were standing in line and so they so strategically put there a whole set of for sale books right right while you're waiting in line so you don't just buy what you got you even buy more because it's on sale and I remember picking up this book on funny facts of history and as I took it they said in Rome there came a time that they were losing the Caesars and their dictators so fast that they that the sculptures couldn't sculpture the bust of them fast enough So what they did was, there came a time that they would only do the heads and screw one head off and put a new head on at that point because they kept, folks, let me just tell you something. We live in a time, one head comes off, another head comes on. In four years, you have Trump over here, and then you have President Obama, Obama, and then President Biden. Folks, it could be Putin, it could be Yeltsin, it could be Corbyn. Let me just tell you, we live in a world that you just pull the head off and you put, let me just tell you who who is not leaving the head and the helm of what we're all about. His name is Jesus. He is the king. He sits on the throne. And though a king is dead, the king is alive and well. Hallelujah. Isaiah reminds us that this is not just any king. When you want to emphasize something in the English language, you underline it, or you put an exclamation mark at it, or you punctuate it. In the Hebrew language, if you want to emphasize something, you say it twice. Jesus would go like this, verily, verily. But not on this one. The Hebrews would double the word to emphasize it. But when you speak here, he says, we got to say it three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it was as if, it was as if heaven was saying to Isaiah, there are not enough words in your English language to describe the king that you need to see. See, holiness, he was saying, is the controlling attribute of God. It never says in the Bible, love, love, love. It never says in the Bible that he is power, 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 but it says he is holy, holy, holy. Do you know why it says that? Because that word means it's separate. There's no one like him. It means that you can look far and wide, east and west. There is no one that can be found. And so when you say holy, 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 you are saying there is no one like him whatsoever. And that's why when Isaiah sees the king on the throne, Isaiah says, I'm ready to respond to anything he wants me to do. Remember that, remember that phrase when, he, when all of a sudden he goes, who shall we send? Here am I, Lord, send me. Because when you see God, you're willing to do whatever God wants you to do. When you see the king, there is no discussion. There is no debate. What do you want me to do, God? This isn't a negotiation. You're the king. I'm just reporting for duty, Lord God. That's all I'm doing. The world has changed, but the throne has not changed. We may see a dictator. We could see presidents. We could see NATO. But I'm telling you, I want to see a king on the throne, the king on the throne, who is holy, holy, holy. The church, God is speaking to the church today. 
that we are connected by the blood of Jesus. We're not, a Ukraine, we're not a Ukrainian church, a Russian church, an American church. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And he is calling the church to pray. It is a word to the church. That's the birth pain. Number two, it's, a, it's, it's God saying, lift up your eyes to the throne, Ukrainians, Russians, Americans. See the king on the throne, the king. But let me just finish with Jesus' words and close as we finish today. I believe God is getting us ready for the revival that is coming. It's not just the church, and it's not just the throne, but God is getting us ready for a revival. There is a famous painting that is hanging in one of the European galleries. No one really even knows how long this painting has been hanging there. And it, it is one of the... It is, it, it is, a painting that communicates kingdom principles. Listen to this. It's a chessboard with the devil sitting on one side and a young man sitting on the other. The devil is gloating while this young man has this look across his face of being dejected, forlorn, and defeat is stamped on his face as Lucifer is looking across this chessboard, and the title of the painting is called Checkmate. Young man looking across, Satan sitting back in his chair, and it's called Checkmate. I was reading the story of Paul Morphy, the only American chess champion of the world, other than Bobby Fischer, who toured Europe and visited that gallery. And it said that when he sat in that gallery and gazed at that painting called Checkmate, Satan gloating over this young man. As he started studying not only the picture, Paul Morphy, because it's in him, started studying the chessboard. And while he is sitting there, he looked at his assistants and said, get me a chessboard, get me a chessboard. And right there in the gallery, they bring Paul Morphy a chessboard, and he starts setting up the pieces exactly the way it was in that painting. And all of a sudden, as he looked over this board, the chess champion reached over to the board and moved the young man's king one space over and said, the devil is now checkmated. And this is what he said, when the king has one more move, the game is not over. Let me just say this again. He said, when the king has one more move, the game is not over. Can I just tell you something, folks? The king has one more move. The king has one more move. 2,000 years ago, This world was checkmated by sin and the devil right there on Calvary's cross. And just when it seemed that it was over, the king had one more move. It was called resurrection. He says, I've got one more move. Don't say, don't say checkmate yet because he's been in the grave three days. The king still has one more move. Not only did Jesus say these are birth pains, and, but he also said, don't be afraid and don't be alarmed by what you see happening around the world. Why? Because the king, hallelujah, has one more move. Folks, listen, there's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. Russia could go to the Middle East. China could begin to invade Taiwan. But don't be afraid. You know why? The king has one more move. Folks, they, they're talking about, get ready, New York City. They're talking about a cyber attack that can shut down the banks, that can shut down the industries, that can shut down everything. But I want to give you a good word today. Don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. you know why? The king has one more move. If you're sitting here today and you've got family and you've got sons and daughters and granddaughters that may be calling into the military and going overseas and you're worried about what's going to happen and you're worried about what's going to take place. Don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. You know why? The king has one more move. What's the move, Pastor Tim? You ready for this? I want you to get this. Matthew 24, 8 through 14 is the last move. He says, all these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you're going to be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Folks, there's a persecution that's coming. That's the Finland thing we talked about. 
And then he says this, and at that time, many will turn away from the faith. It's go- persecution, what he was saying to us, persecution begins to let us know who's in and who's out. He says, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Focus for just a moment, folks. I believe what he was saying was that many are going to turn away from the faith, betray, and hate each other. That's what you see. And many false prophets. What he was saying was division will be a weapon the enemy will use to fight the church. Let me say that again. To stop the power of a praying church, there's nothing that can stop the power of a praying church than division in the church. And folks, I just want to tell you, don't be caught on the wrong side of division. Let God guide you. The enemy will try to destroy unity and would not be ready to be effective for the last days. Why? He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And here it comes, folks. The king has one more move, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony. This is how he finishes this whole birth pains and the end is not yet. He says it will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. He said persecution will come, divisions will come and abound, but he's talking about an awakening is going to come. The king has one more move. This gospel will be preached in the whole world. That's why, folks, it is not a pipe dream to believe about moving the needle with one billion souls. I believe that God is able to do that. There'll be a global revival, and then the end will come. Wars are simply the birth pain. Worldwide revival, that's the finale. That's what Jesus is talking about. He says when that happens and the gospel is preached, then the end will come. So what do we need to do here at Times Square Church? What is, what's the command for us? Here it is as we get ready to close. He says, because of the love of many in the church will grow cold. This is what he says. Pray for the fire of God and pray for strength to stand. Pray for fire. That when, when Freddie leads us in worship, oh God, ignite my heart with fire to worship. God, give me the strength to stand against anything that begins to come our way. Pray for the fire of God in our lives, strength to stand. Let me close with this as the team begins to come, because if you're sitting here today, you have, you have to decide where you begin to lift your eyes to. You have to decide today. Is it a king, or is it someone, a world ruler from president to was it a, whether, whether it is a, a Congress or and it, whoever it is. This is not a political message. It is a message that says, look on high to the throne that doesn't change. God is king. And the smartest thing, the wisest thing you can do today is to trust your life to the king. It's the wisest thing you can do. When you, tr- when you do that and you trust him forever, Everything changes in your life. The world has changed in one night. The world you live in. Cindy and I sat with our daughters and just said, the world has changed today. And one of my daughters goes, we're witnessing history, aren't we? I said, you're witnessing history. But folks, here's what's amazing about God. You can be changed in a moment. Though while the world has changed, you can be changed in the midst of this. If if a boat is in a storm and it's going back, can I just help you? You don't hold on to barrels and to things that are moving. You hold on to the thing that's battened down and and bolted into the floor. you got to hold on to the immovable. If you hold on to things that are moving, folks, you're going to get thrown off. And I'm telling you, This is the moment you hang on to God today. Now, now let me just say this. Not church, not a religion, not a denomination. Those things are movable. God is immovable. God is immovable. I'm not inviting you to join a church. I'm not inviting you to join a denomination or a religion. I'm not asking you to be a member. I'm not asking for any of that. I'm asking to grip hold of the one, the one throne that is not going anywhere. 
Because when God comes and changes your now, he changes your forever. Because I don't just need to be changed now, I want my forever taken care of. That's how it all changes. If God can come in right now. If this is the move the king is making, he brought you here today. You're listening online today. That king has one more move. That king who sits on the throne, he loves you today. He loves you today. He's unlike any king in history. While kings and dictators, presidents and leaders send out soldiers to die, tell me a name of a king. Tell me the name of a king that sends his most beloved prize, his own son, to die. That's the kind of king we serve. King Jesus. God on the throne sends his own son to die for you. He doesn't say, you die for me. He says, I will die for you. Folks, what is that? That's an everlasting love that he loves you that much. While religions are going, do this and do that, do this, God is the one that says, I'll do it for you because you don't have the ability to do it. You can't, you can't do it for yourself. God came and did it for us. And as you're sitting here today and as you're watching today, there is a king that loves you so much that he would send his own son to die for you. And not only to forgive you of your sins and to change you from the inside out, but he is a king. He is a king that says, I want to spend eternity with you. I want you to live forever. The most important question anybody could ask you is this. Because as you're hearing above on the news about death and even children so tragically that have died on the bombings and all that's happening, it's the most important question. Because when you start dealing with the brevity of life and the fragility and how fragile life is, the question that comes to all of us is, what happens after we die? It's the most important question. You can, when, if you were to die today, where will you spend eternity? Where will you spend eternity? And today, that question can be answered. How, how do I know today, Pastor Tim, that I will be in heaven? How do I know today that I will have eternal life? How do I know that today? If I was to ask you that question, how do you get to heaven? Some of you may go, I've been water baptized. I was christened. I went to a mosque. I went to a synagogue. My parents were religious. I'm a good person. Those are all great things. Let me just tell you, they're not going to get you there. I, I, I'm sorry. Good things. If you're here today, I've heard this. How are you, why are you going to heaven? I didn't kill anybody. And I said, and I want you to continue on that path. Especially now. But I said, as good as that is, that won't get you to heaven. You could put any label you want. I'm a Jew. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Mormon. I'm the, put any label you want today. Jesus said this. No man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. Jesus' words. I talked to people here today. My, two of my favorite people I had a chance to see, both of them ironically are 82 years old. My 82-year-old friend who drives in from Long Island, who makes, it, who makes us known that is no excuse for not coming to church. <laughs> he drives in from Long Island on Sundays and Tuesdays. And then my dear sister who sits in the back, she is 82 and walks from lower Manhattan and walks to church every single Sunday just to be here. If, I was to, if you were to ask me this, how do you get to their home? I have no idea. They know how to get there. So here's the question. How do you get to heaven? That's where Jesus is from. How do you get there? Well, you, you, you've got to be water baptized. You've got to be this. You've got to, hey, folks, let's just get this straight. Nobody knows the directions to their own home better than Jesus himself. If Jesus is from heaven, let him tell you the directions. Because if you're sitting here today and you think you know the directions, I'm telling you, he just told you. You have to be born again. Those are the directions to his home. No, no matter what you say, Jesus, who cannot lie, tells the truth on how to get to heaven. And today, your forever can be changed. The question is this, have you been born again? Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? We tell children, you have to learn your ABCs. And here at Times Square Church, you're going to learn your ABCs. Those three letters can change your life. 
And each one of those letters really leads us to how to be born again. A, it's admitting that I'm a sinner. It's starting from the very spot that says we're all broken on the inside. Every one of us, starting with me, have a condition. It's called sin. We were born that way. We were born. The diagnosis is not simply environment or DNA. The, the diagnosis is sin. It came all the way back from the Garden of Eden. We all have this diagnosis. Or as one pastor said, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We're sinners in need of a Savior. We don't need a second chance. We need a second birth. That's what, God, that's what we need. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? How do I deal with the sin issue? That's what the king on the throne did. It's B, believe. Believe that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son to come down here to fix a sinful condition that I couldn't fix myself. If we could fix ourselves, then why would God have to send his son to die on the cross? It'd be the worst case and the ultimate case of child abuse. If I could get myself to heaven by being a good person, Jesus wouldn't have to come and die on the cross. But Jesus did die on the cross because he was becoming my sin bearer. He died the death that I was supposed to die, lived the life that was impossible for me to live, and gave me a reward, heaven and forgiveness that I didn't even deserve. And finally, at sea, confessing him, here's a big one, as Lord. This is what separates religion and relationship. To say Lord means you're in charge, you're the boss now. Question, do you think God sent Jesus to die on a cross simply to get us to sit in a seat on Sunday? That's not what he came to do. He didn't sit there to go like, okay, you died on the cross, you're resurrected, and they're sitting in church on Sunday? Good. He's not interested in two hours on a Sunday. He's interested in eternity. He's not simply wanting to get you to church. God sent his son to get you to heaven. That's what he's come to do. Christianity is not coming to a place. It's coming to a person. It's coming to Jesus himself. I don't, I don't do what God wants me to do for an hour and a half on Sunday. But God, you have every day. That's called lordship. And today, just as you had a first birth, Jesus said, you need a second birth. That's what it means to be born again. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment here. In these next few moments, this is life-changing. Because of some COVID protocols that, that as, as time goes on, we'll lift a little bit, and we just want to be cautious. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I won't even make you walk forward. But I want to speak to people that need, that are here today saying, I want my life changed from the inside out. I want that, what you're talking about, Pastor Tim. I want to be born again. So, Pastor Tim, what's the next step? What are you going to ask me to do? What, 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 where do I go from here? Here's what we're going to do. In about 90 seconds, we're going to pray a born-again prayer. We're going to pray a prayer that says, God, come in and change me from the inside out. A prayer that says, forgive me. A prayer that, that starts a brand new life for us, not only here but for eternity. It's not a magic prayer, but it's a prayer that comes from our heart. And if you're here today, whether you've been invited, whether crisis is helping you see the throne today, today could be the change. Both in the balcony, on the main floor, and on camera, those who are watching by way of camera, listen, listen. Today, today, your life can be changed. Today, you can say, King Jesus, come in and change me. If you're here in this place today, and say, Pastor Tim, I want to be born again. When you pray that prayer, would you include me? I want to start a journey with God. And some of you are already beginning to talk yourself out of it. I, I, well, I'm not perfect. Folks, welcome to the club. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And today that can change. God can come in and start this brand new journey. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you to do one thing, and we'll all pray together. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that prayer, and I want to see, I want it, it, because I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and I want to, see if this is your decision time, this is you saying, I look to the king. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, I want to be part of that. Put me in that prayer today. If that's your heart, without any hesitation, every head bowed and every eye closed, Pastor Tim, put me in that prayer 
without any hesitation, hold your hand up right now. Just hold it up as high as you can because I want to make sure I see every hand. Keep them up high because I want to make sure I count. There's one, two, three, four. Keep them up. I want to make sure I see them. I want to make sure I see five over there, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Balcony, let me make sure I see you. Twenty-one. Keep them up. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. That's fantastic. Can we thank God for those 21 hands that have gone up today? Thank God for that. Come on. Can we pray this? And online, you can make that decision right now. Just type in saying, I'm making that decision. Come on. Can we pray all this together? Come on. Let's say this together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. Come on, can we say amen today and thank God for that? If you're online, listen, type that and say, I pray that prayer. Can we all stand together? I'm going to ask you to do me one favor. Before we close and sing today, I want you, if you made that decision, one of the 21 here or you're watching online, I want you to text the word DECIDED to 51,000. We are working on next steps to help you grow in the most important relationship that you've ever had. Listen, not only do we want to pray for th that we want to walk with you, but even today, before we leave this place, we want to pray with you.